Good evening, everyone. This is Mick Beesbor. I'm the preaching minister for the New Braunfels Church of Christ. Good evening, online friends, guests, members alike. Uh, we're glad you're here with us for this Wednesday evening. In a moment here, I'm going to be offering a short devotional talk. But before I do that, I would like to lead us in prayer. Namely, I want to pray for uh, kind of the increase in COVID-19 across our country, across the world. Pray for nurses and doctors in the front line of this pandemic. Um, praying that all that can be resolved sooner than later. I, I know you and me and everyone is just tired, tired of, of COVID-19. So pray for resilience, pray for patience, and most importantly, pray for a cure. Pray for our country right now. There's a lot of people on the edge. And so we're praying for the, the grief and the pain and the anxiety. And let's remind us as Christians who we are. We are citizens of the kingdom of God. And so it's great to be living here at this time in this place, in this history, but more importantly, we are followers of Jesus. Let's also pray for those who are hurting and struggling and who are grieving lost loved ones, namely the family of Polly McCammy, the family of Clarice Baggett, and the family of Byron Bradfew. Speaking of Byron Bradfew, his memorial service is this weekend, and so if you've not yet had the chance to check out our email or online information. You can get information about the memorial service or any other news and information about our church. You can also download or look at the prayer list or even offer um, prayers that you need. And so uh, you can get online and check all that out if you need to. Let's pray together and let's have our time together tonight. Let's pray. God, thank you for um, this chance to be together, even if it's through technology. We're looking forward to the time where we can have handshakes and hugs and where we can encourage one another face to face. Uh, it makes it more difficult each day to be isolated from one another, to not be able to be in community. We were created and built for community. And so we pray for, uh, uh, pray for that COVID uh, no longer exists. More importantly, let's pray for the nurses and the doctors and for a cure. And uh, God, pray for our hearts and our souls and our minds. Let us be at ease. Let us find peace and strength that surpasses all understanding. Let us be the people that you've called us to be, whether this is with the pandemic, whether it's during election season. God, we pray for those who are hurting right now, who have lost loved ones in the recent days and weeks. Uh, we pray for them. We pray for their hearts and their souls. We pray that, um, that your, your presence be made known to them and that we as a church can love on them and walk with them uh, during this season. Uh, God, be with all of us. Be with our time together in your word. And I pray that tonight is an encouragement, a blessing to people. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right. So if you have the chance, grab your Bibles. Or I guess if we're going to be on computer screens, you can just go to like one of those Bible websites like Bible Gateway or something. We're going to begin in Exodus chapter 15. This is a text that the people of God sang right after they left the Red Sea. And so maybe they might still be dripping even a little wet. Maybe they weren't wet. I don't know. Would water be splashing from the sides of the walls? Does that really matter? I don't know. Who knows, right? Um, but we do know this, that they were delivered out of captivity. And this is their response. They say, I will sing to the Lord for he is highly exalted, both horse and driver. He has hurled into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my defense. He has become my salvation. He is my God. And I will praise him, my father's God, and I will exalt him. Okay, the reason why I wanted to bring up this passage is because we think about the Red Sea. This Red Sea is this moment where the people of God are released from captivity, released from slavery at the hands of the Egyptians. It's this incredible escape. It's the great escape. Great Escape. Uh, that's that Steve McQueen movie uh, filmed in the 1960s. I remember that movie growing up. That was one of my dad's favorites. I used to watch that movie. Uh, what was that Steve McQueen movie? It was about um, him and other prisoners of a German war camp dug tunnels and, and crafted this creative and amazing way to kind of escape the prison. And you'll have to watch the movie, but it's, it's pretty good if, if you're okay with 60s movies. Uh, but the point is, is this Great Escape that the people of God... Um, leave their own prison and now they are free. Oftentimes we use the Red Sea as an image of a past orientation of slaver, of slavery and captivity. But there's also the other side of, of the Red Sea, excuse me. <clears throat> the Red Sea also gives us a future orientation. The Red Sea is a bridge towards the future of God's people. right? So think about it. 
captivity, slavery, and now liberated, free. God promises them um, a place to live. Essentially, what God's promising them is a kingdom. God is promising them salvation, right, to be with God. That, that's the essence of this. It's an, a similar theology is baptism, that, you know, there's this, you once was, you were, you were captive and, and held by sin, but now because of baptism, you are liberated and free, and you are saved by God through Jesus Christ. So we often see baptism, the imagery of like resurrection, uh, but another good imagery is the Red Sea, right? So um, that leads me to kind of the conversation tonight. And what I want to talk about is this, that I think the mission right now for Christians is to be people who focus on the future orientation for other people. What I mean by this is this, we are a bridge to people and we help people we help them. We we grab them from this past, this this life of captivity, and we usher them. We move them forward into a life of freedom and salvation that can only be found in Jesus Christ, a life with God. We are called to be bridges for people, to help people kind of pass this huge gap to be with God. Okay, so I like bridges. And New Braunfels has cool bridges. I lived in Portland, Oregon, and Portland, Oregon had 12 bridges. And what makes these bridges so unique is they're all different architecturally, color. They're really fascinating. If you've ever been to Portland, Oregon to see all their different bridges. Uh, I grew up kind of nearby San Francisco. The Golden Gate Bridge is so iconic. It's absolutely beautiful if you can find it on a day where it's not so foggy. The longest bridge in the world is a bridge called the Danyang Kunshan Grand Bridge. And that is in China. And this bridge is 102.4 miles long. That's right. You heard it. A bridge that spans over 100 miles. It's huge gaps. Huge bridge. Okay. As I mentioned, a significant piece or component to our calling as Christians is that we are to be a bridge for other people. And I think that is especially true right now. Loving your neighbor is easy when there is little distance to cross. Loving your neighbor is easy when there are no conflict of interests, when you are similar people, similar lifestyles, maybe they match your own, maybe you're two young families with the same amount of kids, whose kids become friends, you have similar interests. That's a, a, a small gap where you can kind of build this strong relationship with your neighbor. And in fact, speaking of kids as parents, we encourage our own kids to spend time with kids like them, um, you know, with similar interests and build those relationships. I mean, that, that's, that's kind of our safety net. We, are, we, we gravitate or uh, we follow people who are kind of like us. But maybe Christians are supposed to be different. And maybe a time such as this reminds us that we, as the people of God, have a calling. And our calling is to build bridges where the gaps are huge, like the Danyang Kunshan Bridge. And that God needs us right now to bridge the massive gaps, the massive divisions in the world around us. I want to turn to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians 5 says, Therefore imitate God like dearly loved children. Live your life with love. Follow the example of Christ who loved us and gave himself up for us. He was a significant, or excuse me, he was a sacrificial offering that smelled sweet to God. So Jesus was this incredible offering that God just smelled and that aroma was absolutely beautiful. Okay, speaking of smells, there's a lot of smells in this world that we can identify as kind of nasty and, and gross, right? Uh, and what is God calling us to be? God is calling us to be this sweet fragrance to the world around us. And the way that we can be a, a sweet fragrance to the world around us, the way we can imitate God like love children is if we live our life like Christ did in this example of love and that we make ourselves sacrificial, 
that that is kind of the foundation and the pillars of building this bridge, the massive gaps that exist around us, that we kind of exemplify and model the love of Christ. We are called. We're not asked. We are called. We are expected to go across vast differences, to kind of imitate and witness to the world who God is and what God has done for us. Think about it. What type of distance did Jesus travel in order that you might be reconciled to God? I mean, even if you're a good person and grew your uh, grew up your whole life in church, um, I'm certain because you're a human being that you are sinful and you've got some real struggles and issues. You got your own sins that you are fighting, and as a result of that, there was this gap at some point, and Jesus spanned incredible distances to ensure that you have this freeing relationship that you were held in sin and you cross the Red Sea into a life of freedom, a life of liberation that can only be found with God. And now that's our calling. We are bridges. We are called to be the type of people that brings these massive gaps and narrows it down that people can literally literally find a relationship with us, a relationship with God. We in no way should ever contribute to the chasms and gaps that exist in the world around us. We should always be bridges to the world around us. Peter and Jesus had this complex relationship. It's probably the best way to say it, the Apostle Peter. Um, Peter was often the first to engage and to connect with Christ, which often meant he was the first to fail. Probably his biggest disappointment in ministry was when he denied Jesus three times. And there's a story in John chapter 21 where there's this beautiful reunion between Jesus and Peter. It's a story about really all the disciples and they were fishing and Jesus shows up post-resurrection. And uh, long story short... Uh, they're able to catch a lot of fish, right? Because Jesus was the greatest of fishermen. And then apparently Jesus is a pretty good chef too, and he grills them some good uh, fish. And so after eating, there's this conversation that follows between Jesus and Peter. So in verse 15, it starts with this. It says, when they, meaning Jesus and, and his followers, had finished eating, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these Simon replied, Yes, Lord, you know I love you. Jesus said to him, Feed my lambs. Jesus asked a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Simon replied, Yes, Lord, you know I love you. Jesus said to him, Take care of my sheep. He asked a third time, Simon, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was sad that Jesus asked him a third time, Do you love me? He replied, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And so Jesus said to him, Feed my sheep. There's a lot to this text. We can talk about uh, why Jesus is, is telling him to feed lambs, take care of sheep, and feed sheep. But what I want to point out is this: is that even though Jesus, or excuse me, even though Peter denied Jesus three times, um, Peter, in response, kind of affirms, confirms, confesses, professes, however you want to say it, to Jesus, "I love you." Three times. Do you love me? Jesus asks, I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. Okay, I think that might be the best question to ask for a middle of the week devotional class. Let me ask you tonight, do you love Jesus? Seems like such a, a simple question, and yet maybe your response should be threefolded. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. Okay, if that's true, which I think it is, then let's take care of the people around us. Let's love our neighbors. Let's close the gaps that exist. And let's be a bridge this week. Have a good night, my friends. And I'm looking forward to seeing you all again soon. Blessings to each of you.